Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to an episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Vlog. This is episode 198, I think. Uh, we're counting down to episode 200, and after that I am going to take a little bit of a break so we can sink our teeth into some of the Green Lantern stuff that I want to talk about. And uh, if any major Venom news pops up between now and Comic-Con, we'll talk about it. But obviously I'm thinking they're going to hold off on anything else major until Comic-Con itself. Unless it leaks out there, you know, or there's some rumors go around. Uh, I'll do my best to cover some of it, but mostly I'm going to save it all for Comic-Con. So after episode 200, we're just going to take a little bit of time off. So I hope you hopefully you guys are okay with that and just the major things I want to get through in these next couple of episodes is just these last two storylines I want to talk about spectacular spider-man the hunger and I also want to talk about the the like the, I guess the last wasn't the last will of testament of uh, Eddie Brock but it was like the last temptation of Eddie Brock or something along those lines uh, we're gonna talk about that in a few episodes from now or maybe the next episode but today we're gonna to talk about spectacular spider-man the hunger uh, which is, is not venom the hunger the miniseries from the 90s it is called spectacular spider-man the hunger and it's the first five issues Issues of a new spectacular Spider-Man book that was launched by Paul Jenkins and Humberto Ramos right after the uh, you know the Venom versus Carnage miniseries came out and then also right after the Daniel Way run of 18 issues of Venom stuff so it's not going to touch a lot on stories that happen in those books but what it is going to talk about a lot is the uh, introduction of cancer to Eddie Brock and his past and his lore uh, and give a new uh, reason for the symbiote feeding off him all these years so it's a pretty interesting tale it's definitely one that retcons a few things and adds a lot of stuff uh, uh, so we're gonna you know we have a lot to talk about so without further ado let's get right into it so spectacular spider-man the hunger uh, this book was actually a relaunch of the spectacular spider-man book uh, it was canceled soon after the clone saga in the late 90s and early 2000s and that's when john byrne and howard mackie decided to do their spider-man the next chapter and kind of you know, ease people back into the Spider-Man world, but they didn't really ease people back in that much or that well, I feel, uh, although I like both those guys and I think they're tremendously talented. The stuff they did with Venom felt like a miss to me. And I think the reason why is because they try to go back to the villain roots of Venom and they try to make him strictly a villain again. And at that point, a lot of people had already liked and accepted him as the anti-hero. We had Carnage. Carnage was introduced because fans liked Venom so much that the writers and everyone at the time were like, look, we weren't expecting this, so let's kind of lean him towards being more of a good guy. I know he's killed people, but let's put him more on a redemption path and let's kind of try to get him to a place where people kind of root for him still. He might still have a hard edge to him. He might still be like, not extreme as like the Punisher, but at least like, let's have him do more good than bad, I guess. And so at that point, I think most fans have accepted Venom and Eddie Brock as that kind of character, especially after all of his miniseries. And even though they try to end those miniseries on a villain note, it's still people in their mind remembered Lethal Protector and they wanted him to be a good guy, or at least more of a good guy than a bad guy. So when they did, you know, the next chapter, that didn't really sit well. And so when they did Daniel Way's run, that's why Daniel Way was like, all right, let's take a, a piece of the symbiote and make that a straight villain. And that way, when we introduce Eddie Brock later, he still, you know, could kind of be on the anti-hero side. And, uh, and I thought that was kind of a smart direction to go in and still have like your cake and eat it too, in a way. But at this point, you know, after Venom, Car uh, Venom vs. Carnage miniseries, which we talked about recently, after that, I think Paul Jenkins and Marvel were like, look, we got to get Venom, uh, we got to do something with him. We want to add to the mythos. We want to you know, maybe make him more sympathetic and get him back to those kind of anti-hero uh, way, but also add a new element to it. And I don't fully agree with what they did, but I do like the execution. And I thought the story that they told went very well. And I think Humberto Aramis' artwork on this was also very good. So let's dive in and let's talk about specifically what they did in Spectacular Spider-Man The Hunger. The book starts off and it starts building a mystery. Uh, you have this woman walking down an alleyway and she gets attacked by an unseen assailant. Uh, and then it cuts to like a hard cut to Detective, uh, I think his name is Neil Garrett. Uh, yeah, Neil Garrett. And uh, Neil Garrett is like a new detective on the scene. He's uh, something Paul Jenkins introduced. Uh, Paul Jenkins, what I love about his stuff is that he really does add an element of New York to uh, his Spider-Man run. He adds a, a big supporting cast for Peter Parker. In this book, Peter Parker lives in a new building and he's like, you know, becomes friends with everyone that lives in the building. A lot of people that live there are kind of young and kind of around his age and some younger, some a little bit older, but uh, he, he really wanted to cast a big web, uh, you know, in a way uh, of a supporting cast. And he brought Aunt May back in and Aunt May kind of knows Peter as Spider-Man at this point. So there's a lot of really great elements that I think uh, Paul Jenkins does, including stuff with Flash Thompson which we're going to talk about very soon and how serendipitous uh, and cosmic uh, that it is that this is a Venom story that introduced the, the cancer element to Eddie Brock but also uh, brought Flash Thompson back into the mix as well. 
uh, in a very tragic way too. Uh, so that's a lot of stuff to dive into in this in this run. So the book starts off with this murder mystery and Detective Garrett is trying to figure out what's going on. And the newspapers have deemed this killer or this assailant as the vampire killer or whatever. And the reason for that is because there's two puncture marks like vampire teeth above the person's kidney, but not in the neck. So it's not like a traditional vampire thing, but they are kind of draining the person of their adrenaline and, and other, you know, fluids from them as well. And so uh, they, they're, you know, deemed the vampire killer. But Dr. or Detective Garrett, not Dr. Garrett, but Detective Garrett isn't really sure what's going on. And he's trying to figure it out. So he's working this murder mystery case, trying to figure out who is attacking these people and why he's going after these people specifically. And he's tr working with a guy named Charlie and a couple other people trying to deduce what the connection is between all these victims. And then meanwhile, on Spider-Man's side, we have the Flash Thompson story. And this is actually really tragic. It's something Paul Jenkins did uh, to really turn the screws. He was like, you know what? Norman Osborn's back. And if we're going to bring him back after his spectacular death in the comics many, many years ago, and since they brought him back in the Clone Saga, I really want to make this guy really evil. If he's going to come back and be the big threat, I want to really focus on that. So one of the things Norman Osborn's doing is attacking Peter Parker's personal life through the people he once cared about. So Flash Thompson in the comics, I think at the, around this time, he had he'd already been a soldier. He went to war, he went to Vietnam. Uh, he's come back already, obviously. I think he was a gym teacher uh, at the school that Peter Parker was teaching at. Uh, that was another element that they started to introduce. Um, I think the teacher's thing started to come a little bit after this. Uh, so Peter's still kind of doing stuff for the Bugle and, and kind of in between jobs at this point in his life. But Flash Thompson is was, I think, a gym teacher and, uh, and doing that, and, and like that was kind of his profession. Uh, but Norman Osborn knew Flash Thompson had a connection to Peter Parker, and also Flash Thompson had a, a problem with drinking and other things like that. So you know, basically what Norman Osborn did is he got uh, Flash Thompson drunk uh, and just put him in a car and drove him into, I think, the school that he worked at and put people's lives in danger and made it look like a drunk driving incident, uh, which is really tragic and obviously uh, horrible, uh, you know, on many levels. And, uh, and so Flash Thompson is at this point in a kind of comatose. He's a vegetable for lack of a better term. Uh, he's in a wheelchair and uh, he, he's kind of brain dead. And so he's, uh, so at the beginning of this book, he's in his hospital bed and everyone's trying to figure out what to do with him. Liz Allen is there. Uh, so you get to bring Liz Allen back into the Spider-Man storytelling, which was great. I love seeing Liz again. I love seeing her now with Venom stories too, uh, is really good. Um, so Having this happen was just, it was awful. Like at this point in the comics, I was really feeling not only for Peter Parker, but for people like in his wheelhouse, like everyone around him could be affected by Norman Osborn at any second. And this broke my heart completely and made me really care about the Flash Thompson character even more than I already liked him uh, to begin with because he was already the bully that was turning to be more of a good guy anyway, but he had his problems. And I, I thought that made him a really human character and I really liked that about him. So seeing him in this condition really hurt when I was reading this book. Um, and so they were trying, they're trying to decide what to do with him. And ultimately Aunt May nominates Peter to take the Flash Thompson in, even though she knows he's Spider-Man, she knows it's a lot of responsibility, but she thinks having someone like uh, Flash around Peter will uh, keep that goodness in him because at this point in the comics, he's struggling with a lot of stuff, wants to go kill Norman. There's a lot of dark things in Peter at this point, and I think Aunt May is just looking to save what's left of her nephew's soul, and so she nominates Peter to take care of Flash Thompson, which he does, and it leads to some really amazing scenes in this book between Flash and Peter, who Flash obviously just sitting in his chair, look, you know, Peter puts him where he's looking out the window and then Peter will say things like, hey, go long, you know, and he has like the football and they're sitting there having these heart-to-heart -heart moments in between him going out and being Spider-Man. And I think it added a lot of humanity uh, to this storyline and to Paul Jenkins' run in general over the years that he wrote Spider-Man. All right, so I know we're here for Venom, so let's get back into the Venom stuff now that I went all mushy-gushy on you guys. Uh, so now on the other side, uh, we're adding the sympathy to Eddie Brock. This is what Paul Jenkins brings big time to the table in this story, is what he, he basically focuses on Eddie Brock as a sympathetic character. And you see Eddie Brock going to church like he does. He's Catholic, obviously, and he's going to church and he's confessing these things to this priest. And he's saying, look, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry everything I've done. And the priest doesn't know exactly what he's talking about because Eddie's being very vague. He's not really revealing him his identity, but he is talking about his life, how he talked about the Sin Eater. And he is trying to paint, and this is something that Swordsman and other people have mentioned, where they try Try to paint Eddie Brock as someone who didn't purposely uh, tell the wrong story when it came to the Sin Eater, someone who accidentally got his facts wrong. Um, and I never really bought that to begin with because I always thought they painted him really strongly in the original stories as someone who, uh, you know, wasn't sympathetic and who was just trying to, you know, like to get ahead in his profession. Uh, but 
ultimately more writers have written the sympathetic side and, and written the side that shows Eddie Brock being more like, hey, I got my facts wrong. It could have happened to anybody and I had a lot on my mind at that time. And what Paul Jenkins does was he tries to rationalize it by saying that Eddie Brock finds out that he has cancer. Uh, and he found out a few months before the Sin Eater story took off. So at that point, he just wasn't thinking clearly. And these are all the things that Paul Jenkins adds to the mythos and the lore of Eddie Brock, which is he was distracted, he had cancer, his father, uh, I said his father or his uncle or someone he knew had cancer, uh, and he watched that person become a shell and basically wither away and die, and he never wanted that to happen to him. So when he found out he had cancer and that it was inoperable, he didn't want to go down that path of, uh, you know, of becoming a shell. And so, uh, so he decided to go take his own life. After the Sin Eater thing, he was like, you know what, I lost myself in my work, I tried to, you know, stay focused, but I messed up on a lot of things, and I got the Sin Eater story wrong. I couldn't help it. I got it wrong. And that's the element that uh, Paul Jenkins adds here. And then so Eddie Brock goes to church. He, you know, plans to commit suicide. And he says, I think that's when God, for my sins and for the life I've lived and for the mistakes I've made in my life, I think God introduced a demon to me in the form of an alien symbiote. And I think this is God's way of punishing me somehow for wanting to take the easy way out uh, of, uh, you know, of suicide. And so that's when the suit bonded to him and has been feeding off him all these years. And we're actually gonna find out in the story that the suit is more than just bonding with people, but specifically why it bonds with Peter Parker and why it liked Peter Parker and why it doesn't fully like Eddie, but why it stays with Eddie. And that's another element that Paul Jenkins brings to this story. Apparently the alien symbiote feeds on adrenaline. And there's this great scene in the book where Eddie, uh, you know, gets separated from the suit and the suit tries to rebond with Peter Parker. And that's when we find out that this suit is the killer that uh, Detective Garrett is looking for. And Spider-Man thinks that too, and he, and he finds out Eddie Brock is still on the scene, and so he goes to Detective Garrett and says, hey, this could be Eddie Brock. And Detective Garrett's like, look, I can't you know, corroborate this. You're just coming to me and telling me these facts. I don't know you. We, we you know, we're not, we don't know each other. We're not friends or anything. Uh, he goes, so I can't like corroborate this story. So I can't, you know, do anything. I can't go try to arrest Eddie Brock. So you're going to have to figure out a way to lure him out and, you know, get proof of this or something so that I can be on the case, you know, he goes, but right now I have to focus on the murders and stuff. And I'm trying to find a connection. And, uh, and that's when they start talking. And that's when, you know, Detective Garrett talks to Charlie and figures out that the connection between all these victims is that they too have cancer and that they have, uh, they're secreting a, you know, a, a certain level of adrenaline that the symbiote is after. And that is the connection between Peter Parker and Eddie Brock, because when the suit tries to bond with Peter Parker again, uh, the Fantastic Four get involved and they're trying to separate it and they can't fully separate the suit from Peter. It's fully trying to bond to him. And there's like one strand wrapped around his ankle holding on for dear life. And they can't, using fire, whatever the techniques they can with Human Torch, they're trying everything and they can't separate it because if they do, it'll really hurt Peter Parker because now they are bonded fully. Uh, and so the, uh, you know, so Richards, Reed Richards, uh, Mr. Fantastic is telling Peter Parker, look, you, when you use your spider sense, you are actually secreting a ton of adrenaline. And he goes, and that is what the symbiote is bonding to. It is actually an adrenaline junkie. Uh, and, and so, and we've never figured this out before. In my previous, you know, dis, you know, research on this thing, way back in the Todd McFarlane and Eric Larson days, when the Fantastic Four got involved, and then even in the Daniel Way run, when they got to operate on the symbiote a little bit and look at it, uh, he was like, we never knew that th it was doing this. And I never realized that your spider sense is probably triggered to adrenaline. I because I was researching my own wife's superpowers with her invisibility and I found out that it was actually possibly adrenaline based. And so when she got a, a big surge of adrenaline, she could become invisible. And he goes, and I think that's what's happening with your spider sense. You're getting this adrenaline rush uh, subconsciously and it is triggering this warning sense inside your body. And he goes, and it's helping you pump adrenaline. He goes, that's what the symbiote wants. And Eddie Brock has this rare form of cancer that is also making him secrete a ton of epinephrine and a ton of, uh, of uh, adrenaline coming out of him. And so that's why the suit is okay with Eddie Brock and has been for all these years, but now it doesn't want it anymore. Eddie Brock is drying out. It is running out of, uh, you know, its ability to drain Eddie Brock. So it's looking for another host. And of course it wants its original host back because you can supply this adrenaline 
constantly. It doesn't drain you at all to use your spider sense. Uh, so because you can pump this stuff out, the suit wants you back. And that's basically what the story is, is it's about, uh, you know, the suit wanting its ex-girlfriend back in Peter Parker. And that's what adds to a lot of the drama and the intensity of this storyline. So once Reed and Spider-Man figure all this out, the suit does manage to get separated from Peter Parker and run out into the wild and gets away. Uh, and it is, does go back to Eddie Brock. And at this point, Eddie Brock has already gone back to the priest and he said, please forgive me, father. Here's some money. It's all I have left. I've been saving it under my mattress for a few years. And, uh, and this is all I could, you know, this is what I could muster up. And I was like, I, I feel like I owe you for your time, even though you do this out of the courtesy and, you know, out of, you know, working for God, I guess. Uh, he goes, but I still want to leave something for the church for all the damage I've done. I'm trying to, you know, I, I don't want to, end on a bad note. I want to go out on a good note and I want to go out as a better person than I was when I first came into this church to confess to you. And I thought that was really great. And it definitely puts Eddie Brock back on that sympathetic uh, arc and it definitely puts him in a different light. And so when he has this big conversation at the end with Peter and he's telling him like, look, I have cancer and I, it's, it was inoperable and I had it since the Sin Eater days. That's when I found out. And he's confessing all this to Spider-Man and Spider-Man realizes this is why this guy has hated me for so long. He was, you know, he, he was going to go kill himself and this suit came and invaded his life because of me, because I rejected it. And now that suit, you know, because it found something in Eddie that other people didn't have with this, you know, in, you know, all this pumping out this epinephrine and this adrenaline and all these other things that the symbiote is feeding off of, uh, it, it is now like it fed Eddie Brock's hatred. Eddie Brock was looking for a way out. He wanted his life to end and his life has been limping on all these years and he's been in pain. And even though the suit has been trying to nullify that pain, it's mostly been feeding off him. And now Peter realizes, wow, there's another level of why Eddie Brock and the suit hate me uh, more than anything. The suit hates me because of survival, uh, but Eddie Brock hates me because uh, he's been bonded with this thing that's never really wanted him to begin with. It's using him as a plan B. And now that plan B is drying out. It wants to go back to plan A. And so Eddie Brock once again feels rejected. He's someone who has dealt with that his whole entire life. His father rejected him. The, you know, after the newspaper, the city of New York rejected him. His wife left him. You know, uh, the, all these things, you know, are, are built into Eddie Brock as a character. Uh, he doesn't, he feels rejected all the time. And now he's feeling rejected on the ultimate level. When he needs someone the most to survive, he is being rejected by the suit. And now Eddie Brock is by himself and he's alone and he's dying and he's in a bad way. So when Spider-Man finds him, Eddie Brock is on his last leg. And meanwhile, you know, Peter is having these visions of the suit, of what the suit saw, and you know, from going from Battle World to Spider-Man to Eddie Brock. And what's neat is they touch on, and again, this is Paul Jenkins doing that subtle writing that I love that he does, where he acknowledges, uh, you know, past continuity, but he doesn't just throw it in your face. He acknowledges that this suit was different from the others. He shows an image that uh, Humberto Ramos draws beautifully where the suit is running with a pack of other symbiotes on Clintar, but then it says in the dialogue, I got rejected and I was sent to battle world uh, away from my kind. So right there, not only do we get that story in Planet of the Symbiotes, but Paul Jenkins clearly read Planet of the Symbiotes and he added that continuity and kept it going. And it's like, dude, it's not so hard. Just read past stories and try to weld that into your story that you're trying to tell now. And I think Paul Jenkins does that beautifully here. He does retcon a few little things, but mostly what he does is he adds to the story of Eddie Brock and Venom without tarnishing all the stuff that came before. And I think that's what makes this book the strongest in a lot of these stories that have Venom and Spider-Man fighting each other. So now that Spider-Man is holding Eddie Brock, Eddie Brock is on his last breath here. He's dying and uh, the suit shows up and it says, look, we don't want Eddie, we want you. And Peter's like, yeah, but you're not going to have me, dude. Like I'm telling you right now, like if, if you come at me, uh, like I'm going to, I'm going to hold, I'm holding on to Eddie Brock. I'm going to make you bond with him because he's going to die. He has, and, and as is, as he's saying this, Eddie Brock goes limp and Peter says, look, he's got about two or three minutes before his brain catches up with the rest of his body. You can save him right now. You can rebond with them. And the suit's like, you don't get it. The next person I rebond with, it's it. It's permanent. So that's why I've been sampling people, uh, you know, with these like murders that have been going on. I've been sampling their kidneys or, you know, their, their adrenaline and nobody matches. I need like the only person out, out there that I could find in this vicinity was Eddie Brock, you know, that was a substitute for you, but now there's no one else. I need you. Uh, so next person I bond with, that's it. So I'm going to pick you because you're my best chance for survival. If I pick Eddie, I'm going to have to feel his pain. I'm going to have to feel his cancer. I'm going to have to feel all these things that I don't want to, you know, be a part of anymore. And so, uh, you know, he's basically Peter's like, I don't care. Like, he's like, you're like, that's the thing is like the devil, you know, versus the devil, you don't know. 
don't come at me because I promise you I will find a way to kill you permanently if you bond with me. He goes, I will fight back to my last breath. I will keep fighting you no matter what. He goes, but Eddie needs you to live. He won't fight you. So just rebond with them. Make this happen. And the suit's like, no. So it comes after Peter tries to bond with him. And then Peter, you know, wet shoots a web and the suit's like, ah, you missed. And he goes, no, I never miss. And he webbed Eddie and pulls Eddie into the suit and rebonds Eddie Brock with the symbiote. And again, you know, Spider-Man's at conflict with this. He's like, look, if I rebond them, I could put, you know, the suit could get even more angry, could take it out on more innocent people. It could do everything he was, but I, I believe inside that Eddie Brock is a good person and he won't let the suit hurt any more innocent people. So it's a risk I'm willing to take. And I hope I, it doesn't bite me in the butt. You know, I'm hoping I'm not having another Uncle Ben moment where I'm letting a criminal run by me. I'm hoping I'm doing the right thing here. So he rebonds them and uh, Eddie Brock, you know, gets up and the suit's there and, he, and you know, Eddie Brock inside is probably like, oh, thank goodness I'm still alive. But the suit is mostly the one in charge now. And it's like, look, Eddie's deep down in there. I don't care. He's like, I hate you. You've bonded me with this, you know, person for eternity. Uh, even though we will find out later, that's not going to be true. He goes, but we've bonded me again. And, uh, and I have a child. There was a child in me and you weren't, you know, like I was trying to tell you that, that I am with child again. And at, at this point, I'm like, wait, there's another symbiote spawn coming. Um, but, or this could be a subtle way of, uh, of Paul Jenkins referencing the clone symbiote that has been rebonded to Eddie. And that's kind of what I'm thinking more it is. So this suit is trying to find a host, not only for its survival, but to ensure the, you know, the maturing of this, you know, new symbiote or baby that it's having, or maybe it's the clone that's rebonded with it, uh, which we know later becomes a uh, maniac, uh, in the comic books. So I thought this was interesting. Another interesting, uh, piece to add to the puzzle and to add the you know the symbiote's reasoning for everything it's not just a monster it is not just looking for its own survival but it was actually being a little bit selfless too so it added another wrinkle in the storyline here and added a little bit of humanity to the symbiote even though it was being a monster in the story so all these things all these elements i thought were really good although i was kind of cringing at an, the idea of another baby but now you know again it could be the clone thing for all we know because they never really touch on this anymore after this because as you're going to see in the next stories we talk about it's going to be when eddie brock gets rid of the suit for good or for at least for a, co a couple years in the comic books but in this one it added another interesting story element and then venom is like look i'll deal with you another day because there's still eddie brock in there and he's like let's just leave symbiote let's get away from peter parker and let's go figure things out. So they take off and it leaves Peter Parker, you know, broken and kind of sitting there with his act after he got a whooping uh, sent to him. He's sitting there in the in the woods, leaning against a tree, wondering if he did the right thing. And that's where any good Spider-Man de story definitely ends is with Peter Parker contemplating the actions he's made and wondering if he still is a good person at the end of the day. And at the end of the day on this one, I think he did. He did the right thing and he saved a life. And that's what ultimately Spider-Man does. He doesn't get, you know, the parades and he doesn't get the, you know, the accolades and everyone cheering for him. He has to make the hard decisions. And that's what makes him the most interesting of all the superheroes to me, uh, is that he makes everyday decisions, uh, but he also has to make these really intense decisions like this. And I love this. I love what happened in this book. And I think Paul Jenkins did a great job writing him. And I love his Spider-Man run in general. All right, I'm just rambling at this point. So let me end this by saying thank you for watching the show. If you read Spectacular Spider-Man The Hunger, let me know what you think down below. Did you have a favorite moment in this book? Did you like the book? Did you not like the book? Let's definitely continue the conversation down in the comments below. And then, yeah, in episodes coming up, we are going to talk about the, you know, Venom separating from the suit. Uh, but in the next episode, we are going to talk about some Tom Hardy images that were on his Instagram from the Venom movie from behind the scenes. So that's going to be a lot of fun. I know a lot of you guys have been requesting that for a couple of days now. So I'm sorry I'm late on it, but I wanted to make sure I got this video up first because we haven't talked comics in a while and I wanted to at least get one comic in before episode 200 and I'm glad it was this one because I love this book tremendously. But let me know what you think down below. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff and I'll see you in the future. Peace.